Good evening, all. You're all very welcome to this evening's uh, inclusion webinar. Uh, my name is Grode Balfrey. I'm the development officer for Munster Ladies Football, and I'm delighted to be uh, joined by William Harmon, who is a national uh, development officer for with a remit of coach education. Do you want to say hello to everyone, Will? Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Uh, looking forward to this evening's webinar. Um, Garold, so uh, looking forward to engaging with everybody in the chat function later on as well and hearing to everyone's opinions and thoughts and uh, as the webinar goes on. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this webinar will be approximately an hour to 70 minutes. That might vary. Uh, please feel free to, if you have any questions throughout the evening, just put them into the chat. We'll do our best to get them. We love hearing your thoughts or your views on any of the subjects that we cover. And if there are any issues with um, sound or the video, it's probably better off that you log out and then log back in, and that should fix your problem. Okay, so this, this evening's webinar is a part of a, a larger coach education webinar series. Uh, we've four done to date or right, including this evening and then we'll be our next one will be how to plan for disruption uh, during a season how to manage workload in a session and concussion awareness so those will be our next two after this evening so make sure you check those out and any of our previous webinars are on online or on our youtube page as well so this evening is a follow-on from a previous uh, inclusion, being inclusive as a coach webinar. So we're going to look at being inclusive as a coach this evening from a different type of angle. So we're going to look at being inclusive as a coach, practical solutions to everyday coaching issues. So we'll look a little bit in a little bit more detail as to what that actually means. So our outcome for this evening, by, by the end of the webinar, coaches, ye will be able to identify what barriers coaches face in relation to being an inclusive coach and explore how to negotiate those potential barriers. So let us look back and let's remind ourselves, what is it to be inclusive? So here's our little summary. The person, the coaching skills, so for, firstly, you as a coach are focusing on the person, how you interact, how you engage with your players. Then in relation to the coaching skills, applying the coaching skills of ladies football, all under the ideal principle or the stepper model. Those, all of those um, principles have been covered in our previous um, webinar. So if you want to have a look back at that, you can find that also on our YouTube or LGFA channels as well. So you can look at how to be inclusive as a coach. That's our prior webinar to this evening's webinar. So what we're going to look at today are the challenges or some of the obstacles or want to investigate with some of the obstacles that we as coaches face when we try to be inclusive. We might have great intentions, might understand what it takes to be inclusive, but still might face certain challenges. So that's the direction we're going to take with this evening's webinar. Um, I would like to you to put into the chat what kind of challenges you might face or have faced or think you might face when you're trying to be inclusive as a coach. Now, we also have William Herman on this evening, and William is coaching on a regular basis. So William, I'd like to know what sticks out to you when I ask you what challenges a person or a coach might face while trying to be inclusive? I suppose the big challenge I would have is, you know, I, I would have coached underage uh, this year, Garrod, and I suppose one of the big challenges I would have is parents' expect expectations, Garrod. You know? So, you know, you, you're trying to do something right by the players in terms of whether it be game time, wherever it may be. But then the expectations of parents outside the fence could be different to your, your philosophy and probably have lack of understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve. So that would have been a big challenge for me, Garod, in terms of parents' expectations um, in that sense. So I suppose one of the key things I would try to do is 
how do I improve that communication between myself and the parents or our coaching group and the parents that they're aware of what is it we're trying to do. So that if they understand why we're doing what we're doing, then they may have a better understanding of that. So I think trying to make sure that parents are aware, are very much aware at the start of the year or during the year through regular conversation of what is it we're trying to do. So that would be probably one of my big ones uh, would be, I suppose, meeting the expectations of parents, Garod. But there's a yeah. few coming through here on the on the on the chat as well, Garod. Uh, before you, if you want to, if you want to ask any questions, there is the big uh, age differences in senior group, lack of numbers to carry out drills. Shauna comes across. Uh, I suppose confidence of fellow coaches. Another one, Garod, that's coming across there. Um, I suppose the balance of Morgan says the balance of being inclusive and not get, uh, and not getting to provide constructive feedback. So there's a few things coming through there on the chat function in relation to that. Uh, one or two more. Um, so we have Jane mixed skills base or mixed abilities, and there's maybe one or two as well that may have a disability as well. So there's a, there's a variety of things going on there, really, Gerald. Yeah, no, absolutely. In relation to the parents, you make a fantastic point. Uh, it's getting buy-in and then I think that is kind of emulated in some other people's points there when it's buy-in from coaches, understanding from coaches and kind of the competency of coaches. Are they trained enough to recognize the, what skills and how, it, what different methods there are of applying those skills to different varieties of abilities? I think it's a very good point. How to welcome new members to a close group. It's a very good point, and we'll actually go through a very similar scenario there later on this evening. And just one there, just saw, saw in the uh, chat function uh, by my colleague there, Dipna. Dipna, how are you? Um, in our previous webinar on, on to being inclusive, we really focused on, I suppose, how to be inclusive from, um, I suppose, dealing with people with, that may have a disability as well. So I would advocate, Dipna, if we don't specifically look at that one tonight, uh, if you look at our previous webinar on this topic, uh, we, do, we do delve a bit more into that topic regarding, I suppose, including people that may have a, a disability. So um, I just thought I'd note that before we move on. Uh, Carol. Perfect. No, and thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your comments. And uh, you got a lot of the ones you hit on the things that we were hoping you would hit on and kind of expecting you to maybe hit on. So we realized that a lot of the barriers we face, we all face in different scenarios or in different forms. So some of these potential barriers, just like parents, just like you mentioned, William, varying abilities. How can we cater for different abilities and there might be different expectations of abilities? Competition, how can we be inclusive if it's a competitive environment? A lack of opportunity, are we giving everyone the same opportunity? Playing time, this doesn't have to be just during games, this could be the same opportunities within a coaching setting, within your training sessions. And then expectations, philosophy. Is, is it all about winning within your club? Is it, are you expected to win every year? If you don't win, is being inclusive trying to decide? And then it's gone back to, it has, let's refocus on winning. Being inclusive didn't uh, get us a championship last year. So what do we do? So it's how, how do we deal with these adversities? And that's what we're going to look at today. Just on that, uh, Carol, before we move on, just in the chat function there. Um, so again, uh, Idel, thank you very much. Dual players and managing load. Yeah, 100%. Uh, as I say, guys, tonight, we probably won't focus a lot on these areas, but there is topics we'll be coming across and hopefully we can probably come back to them at the end of the session if we can, if we don't answer all of them very, via, via the, the scenarios. Yeah, but it's still very good. Some very good stuff coming in. So before we take a look at these few scenarios, and we go through it and we'd love to hear your thoughts throughout. Just to preface it, um, these aren't a one size fit all scenario. There will be elements that are similar to maybe your scenario, but there's a lot of different factors and there are different things that might be different from scenario to scenario. So we're not saying what we are saying is the gospel, is going to be the answer for your particular scenario, but it will hopefully inform your scenario and help you and apply the learning from this evening into your coaching setting. And it might help you to navigate some of those barriers that you might be facing. So uh, first question and first scenario, I'm gonna to put to you, William, 
and I'd like to hear your feedback and everyone else into the chat as well. Your coaching philosophy is to provide players with adequate game time throughout the year. This is in line with your club's coaching guidelines. However, a few members of your coaching group think differently. How would you approach this scenario? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of coaches this evening, this evening will probably have a similar scenario that happened. And I suppose for me, there's a few points I make uh, regarding that is that there needs to be clarity uh, on approach, in particular from coaches. So if I'm with a coaching group, Garod, I would I think it's vitally important that we're all clear on what, what we are about as a group as coaches and why we are doing what we're doing in terms of the group that we're coaching. For me, what I always try to do, guys, is I would always try to identify people uh, previous, I suppose, prior to starting the year, that would be like-minded. Um, but what's important is that they would challenge my thinking or my thought process. I think it's very important you get people with you that are like-minded in terms of philosophy, but will still challenge your thought process and, and your thinking. Um, I suppose there might be times, Gero, that you know during the year, a certain game could come up or a certain competition. Do you know what? People's thought process might just go deviate small by going, uh, you know, well, you know, we need to win this game, so we need to make certain decisions. And I suppose sometimes your your philosophy and your thought process could be challenged even during the year, even though you, you have the right people around you. So I suppose for me, what I would do in that situation is I would always have the conversation <laughs> with the coaches and say, okay, before we move on here, I understand what what you're what you're what you're saying, but. Why are we here? What is our aim? What's our outcome? What are we trying to achieve from this? And I would have the conversation with the coaches early because I think it's important that you nip those sort of, I suppose, uh, thoughts in the, in the bud early. Um, so I would have those conversations. Yeah, um, and I think so that's important and a good point that you made as well in relation to, yeah, you could all maybe finish a coaching course or an inclusion course and you all might have said, let's all come on to this inclusion webinar or a inclusion webinar and it's like, yeah, let's look at things differently. Let's do things differently. But then you don't see that coming from your colleagues in a practical setting. And how do you, how do you, when do you have those conversations? So if it was to happen halfway through the year, before, so let's say you're going to, you had your league, all the coaches were very happy to have that mentality, be inclusive, uh, in training and it's not all about winning that is the process and you they bought into it but then that changes after the first championship game and then it's roaring at the sideline it's going let's pick our main players how when do you have that conversation you asked me i suppose girl you're asking that question i suppose there's certain times in girl and let's go back to the point you made there there's certain times when there'll be win games so if you're, you're speaking there about championship or semi-finals or finals, I would deem them win games. So they're okay, guys. I would say, right, lads, right, we, if we, and we communicate this to the parents as well. But it's very important we say, okay, we're clear that when we come to certain games, they're win games, and the players are, are, are expected, or they know the story regarding the same. But you need to be clarity around the, how you approach the whole season and plan it out in terms of that thought process. And I know there's probably a lot of people here tonight, Gerald, that you know, they don't get an opportunity to select their, their coaches with them. And it's the club that would say, right, William, you're with Garrod and Mary and Michael this year. So there could be, a, a, a shall I say, a differences of opinion in that situation. But in that scenario, I would think it's the club that should, that should guide us, that should give direction to coaches on how they should go about their business in terms of their approach and their behaviours. So I know there could be a lot of clubs here or another coaches here that might have coaches that's you know, not, they don't. They can't select them, or they're, they're they're put into a coaching group. So I definitely think the the guidance from the club would be vitally important in that situation to ensure that everybody has a similar philosophy and they're all going in the same direction. I hope that answers that question. Perfect. And uh, yeah, and uh, just to link it back to what you said previously, it's uh, understanding the why. Hundred percent, Carol. Because you know, would you if you're with underage players, or anybody here tonight who are with underage players? In the story, your job is to guide and develop players, you know, and, and, and start creating a love for the game. But if you're with adult team, you know, adult players, then your, your objective then is to, to achieve their goals, you know, help them achieve their goals and sustain that love for the game. But I think it's vitally important that if you, if you can select your own group of coaches and have a similar philosophy 
then obviously you can challenge each other's thoughts in a, in a very respectful way. But at nine times out of ten, you don't get to select your own your own coaching group. So therefore, I believe there needs to be real clarity around the direction from the club uh, to ensure that any issues that may arise can be nipped in the, on, on the bud by the club. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Will. And it's uh, it comes down to ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask it of yourself or ask it of your coaching staff. Who's who's to benefit from this? Yeah. So right. is everyone benefiting if we're going to be a bit more selective, less inclusive? Or is it you just as a coach who wants to win benefiting more than the team itself? So that's a good question to ask you and the others around you if those scenarios do arise. Yeah, but Perfect, I thanks. But I definitely think before we move on to the next scenario, you've got to ask the question, guys. If you feel... If you feel someone is contradicting the philosophy of, of, of what you agreed, then you have to you have to nip that in the ball. I think we have to challenge that a bit more and ask those questions. Okay. Okay, so scenario two, you are dividing your team into groups of training by level of ability in order to allow each player to improve at your own rate. This philosophy stems from wanting to keep your perceived stronger players motivated so how could what could you do to improve this scenario now i'd love to hear from people in the audience guys please use the chat function we will we'll read out your your feedback how would you deal with this scenario but how would i suppose what how how would i approach as a coach Carol, is that i think it's like in part we don't pigeonhole people into into boxes too early so for example you know, as a coach, this is what I, you know, if I'm involved, this is what I do in it, in terms of, I wouldn't have the same groups together in every session. I wouldn't put the perceived stronger players together in a group or the perceived weaker players in the group. I would use a variety of methods in my sessions. So, for example, what I do is, for two or three sessions, I'd have perceived stronger, perceived weaker, whatever it may be, okay, and challenge them that way. But however, what I would do in the next few sessions, I'd mix and match. I'd say, no, don't go do, you know, I'm going to mix and match but I'll use the stepper model to assist with challenging players appropriately. So I may change the rules of the game to ensure that there, you know, everybody feels uh, challenged. Like, for example, if I have mixed ability, I might say to Mary, you kick off your left leg, and John, you're all right, you can kick off your right leg. Or I might play, apply certain rules to ensure that every player is challenged in that, in, that, in, that, in that session. Or I might change it another week and go, okay, I'm going to actually divide them up based on their age. Okay, if there's different age groups. So what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't have the exact same groups together for the whole year. I would mix and match. I think it's important that every player feels they can progress and develop as players. So therefore you need to give them hope and that you know what, if I improve here, maybe I might get an opportunity to play with the other team or vice versa. So that's what I would do is that I would vary the methods in terms of my training, but I would communicate very openly from the very start that that would be my approach. I don't know, Gary, Gary, is there anything you'd like to say in that? And I, and I just check the chat as they come through. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's some things coming in now. Um, yeah, it's understanding what you can do without dividing that group. So you don't want to, where possible, divide the group and ruin that group dynamic. You're creating then divisions. You're creating kind of a hierarchy of... You say there mightn't be a name for a certain team, but the perceived stronger players might know they're the perceived stronger players. And then those who aren't as developed as, uh, uh, as some of the others will kind of recognize that anyway. So you don't want to encourage that, create division so they're comparing each other to each other within that group. So that can really affect negatively the group dynamic. Yeah. If it's a constant change, then that's perfectly fine, just as well mentioned. Um, it's uh, just good to realize what you can do in the same scenario. I always say you can, if you're in a dynamic uh, a dynamic activity and they're running around in a one, one area and they're all practicing the hand pass, one player could be doing the hand pass and they might be really kind of getting it there, or the majority of them. Then there could be a few who are saying, okay, that, this is boring. Do we segregate those groups for the next training? No. We can also just put in another rule or condition for that one player. Ask that one player then to go, okay, go on your non-dominant side now or use both. Then they might be very good at that. It progresses on even more. Then say, okay, you're going to solo before you hand pass. 
then it's solo take your steps before your hand pass or solo on your dominant, non-dominant side. You can progress everything so quickly without having to set up another drill or to divide the group even further. You can keep everyone in that same environment and everyone is coaching at their own rate, but you're not separating the group. So there are so many ways around that. Yeah. Uh, Will, do you want to bring in anything there yeah, from the Shauna, chat? Yeah, Shauna here. Well done, Shauna. I like, I like this. I wouldn't categorize players according to strength, but rather use the sessions to work on issues or use progressions in drills like you mentioned, Garol, there, to improve skills that seem to consistent, consistently, uh, 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 I suppose, are poor across the board. So that's very similar to your point there. Jane, Janie, how are you? Uh, yes, she'd mix up the abilities, Garol, and find that the perceived stronger players and the perceived weaker players will gel well together. Well done, Janie. That's a good idea. And can learn often off each other. And I actually agree with you, Janie. I think that the perceived stronger players and weaker players would actually complement each other and will challenge each other uh, as a result of that. So I just don't think we need to dismiss that idea of mix and matching. Um, so just one more, Edel O'Connor, how are you? I feel it is important for progression players to mix it as it's motivating all. However, it comes to match tactics, selected teams work. I have experienced, uh, I have experienced this. So yeah, there's different times, Edel, you're right. There's certain times during the session or during the year where you need to probably, I suppose, use different methods. But you know your group, you know when's the right time to do that and, and, and when's the best time to do that. Um, Hugh agrees with me, right? thanks Hugh. Um, last year we built up the so-called weaker players conference and within about four weeks they really came on in many facets and had no fear of their illustrious teammates. That kept them all players on their toes. And I agree with you. At the end of the day, we're there to develop all players and we can't dismiss players early. So we have this concept in our mind that you no, know, the players down there are not that great then you're telling them that, but you're you're also decreasing their self-confidence and self-esteem. You should be there to develop them. You never know in three, four years' time where they could be. So it's important we stay patient with everyone early. I don't get Garod, uh, there's some great points coming through. Well yeah, done, everyone. Very good. It's, good. Good. it's you great there. to see you. you're putting yourselves into that mentality and thinking about it in, in those ways. Yeah, and being creative. As we said, not one size fits all for what we're doing, but you can recognize these things and recognize the opportunities to keep your, your teams together and to engage them. Absolutely. I and it's just understanding, making it, making every player understand that they are important. Yeah. And, you know, before we move on to the next one, I know, Kieran, you see, I find stronger, the stronger players' passion, stronger and weaker lose out. 100%, you know. I suppose we're there to motivate everyone. I, I've been involved in sessions, guys. I coach every week. I, I have these scenarios where, where my job is to think about what we're doing. Well, how can I challenge every player accordingly, irrespective of ability? Uh, and they're all involved in the same activities. So it's really just thinking about what you're doing. Okay. Geez, the chat is excellent, Degrod. Hopefully people Fantastic. keep it Fantastic. And because, it's another great you know, point, uh, Karen's point, uh, in relation to understanding the motivations of players as well, Karen. So that's very good. Okay, scenario three, let's move on. You have a settled team and you're winning majority of your games. Two new players want to join your team but have little to no previous experience of playing ladies football. What could you do here, Will? How could you approach this? Would, what comes to mind straight away when I see this, I've, and I've experienced this in the past, mm -hmm. being a part of different teams, underage and coaching our assistant coaching and other teams i've seen players come in and parents have a side conversation at a, at the end of a training session saying oh next week uh, my two girls would love to participate but it's in the middle of a season and that coach has said oh come next year or in two months time and uh, you can register and we'd love to see you next year so what would you do in this scenario, Will? Yeah, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this one because this this is probably happens on a regular basis. Um, uh, or, you know, whereby, you know, the girls just want to join any time and they want to come to meet their friends or because they want to improve or develop or they want to have fun. But I think what's key to this, in my this is just my opinion, is that the attitude of the coach is vitally important here. That it's very open-minded and inclusive and that, yeah, of the first reaction should be, 100%, we love to have the girls involved, bring them down. But it's vitally important then that you integrate them into the group 
and give them the opportunity to develop as well and improve. It'll take them time because they probably be shy. They probably be short in confidence. You know, they're in a group, a new group. So therefore, it's vitally important that we give them the opportunity to develop at their own stage of development. But we don't dismiss them. Just because they have no previous experience doesn't mean that they couldn't develop fast or move up the ranks at, at a fair rate. But what I would do there is I'd have a buddy system, definitely. I would have a buddy system whereby, okay, I would assign probably two or three players in my team an opportunity to probably you know, make them feel valued and welcome. That would be my first protocol. Number one, I'd be straight away, my attitude towards it would be 100% bring them in. And number two, my, my, my attitude would be keep them nice uh, in terms of va- uh, make them feel valued and part of it with a buddy system in terms of the girls making them feel part of the group. Uh, because that's what it's about at the end of the day as well. Perfect. And a lovely comment from PJ. Welcome them with open arms. There's no hesitation there. It's lovely to see. I, yeah, I totally agree. I think the buddy system is a fantastic idea. You just give it a role of your players to kind of uh, take care of those players, make sure if there is anything that maybe a shy player or a new player might feel uncomfortable in the scenario. So at least they, a player might communicate that back to you so you have a better understanding of it. Um, also, I think what others might see, and some would as a hindrance at that stage of the year, um, other coaches, more open coaches, open-minded coaches would see that as an opportunity. Yeah. It's an opportunity to get more players into your team. So obviously you've got this very good thing going, a good team environment. You must be, you're successful, you're winning games. There are new players to the game who are seeing it being done in the correct way. Yeah. They're role models now for these new players. And what better role models could you have to bring girls who are experiencing this game for the first time or very little of this game previously to bring them into the game. What a better introduction, best practice. And you've already the environment to bring them into. So it it is to see it as another opportunity saying, we're in full flight here. Watch us. Let's see. Let's all interact. Let's keep bringing everyone together. But then next year, they know when they're already developing good habits even if it's late on to, into the season. And they'll have those habits coming into the following year. And I think, uh, just before we move on to the next scenario, I, I don't know, coaches, what your thoughts on this. I do believe a lot of, uh, not, not all the time, but research shows that the attitude of the coach or the reaction of the coach uh, is in, could, be a, could be a barrier to new girls getting involved during a season because of maybe you know, this could upset my rhythm. <laughs> this could upset what we're doing. So do you know what I mean? So I, you know, I've read that, you know, that the, the attitude of the coach is a huge, um, could be a huge bar- barrier at times. So just be, be conscious of how you react to these things. Always be open and always be welcoming. And I think that's important uh, that we do that on a consistent basis. And I'll just give you a bit of a, a note there. I, I, a player came into one of my coaching groups. This is a true story in terms of just came back after four or five years, you know, and uh, six months later, they're one of our best players on the team. Um, so it just shows you never dismiss anybody. Uh, you never know how people develop. Um, and I think that's vitally important. Always have that open arms. We just go one through one, one of the comments before we go through. I think, Hugh, how are you? Uh, could depend on what numbers are available to a certain team and how soon they're required. But either way, accept, uh, 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 I suppose, accept them. Uh, they would need a few training sessions to fit in and integrate. You don't want to upset other players or family by re- replacing them so quickly as they have been at their audio. 100% you. Obviously, that's vitally important. You respect those who've given the time throughout the year. It's very important you integrate them in the right way, that they get a feel for the group and that they, I suppose, earn their place as well. It's a very important that they earn their place. But if they're good enough, then down the road, they'll get the opportunity as well, which is vitally important. Yeah, and there's two other good comments above that from uh, Sean and Janie in relation, and they both kind of mirror each other slightly. Um, your first experience in a sport will be one you remember and and you can affect your confidence. So being an open and welcoming coach will increase your chances of sticking with it and developing quicker. It's, it's so important. It's a very good point that you just make. Your first experience in sport. You might presume because they're older, they could be adults, that, oh no, that's fine. They can deal with it. They understand. It's, we don't treat them like we would treat someone who's coming in at under sixes, under eights training. Yeah, yeah. But you do have to have that same level of understanding. 
I think it's a fantastic point that you yes. make. So I we need to be very conscious of yeah. how, what messages we want to come across, how your team want to be portrayed and what you want to be in that situation, what type of coach. And I think my own sister there is involved in football, never played football before, guys. And now she's captain of the of, the, of their club team. <laughs> Started with Gaelic for mothers and others, Garold. Started with for Gaelic for mothers and others, just to go down for a bit of fitness. And now she's captain of the junior team and moved away from ju- mothers and brothers and never played ladies football in her life. Now, take that one. And so, you know, it's interesting in terms of... Absolutely. You know, and the never, same never, point. Never dismiss from anybody. schools. Yeah, never dismiss anybody. Okay, scenario four. Thank you again forever for your feedback. It's fantastic. You have an under 12 go games blitz day approaching the weekend and you want to give all players equal playing time. What type of game formats would you apply to this scenario? So will we say, will hypothetically for this scenario, will we say your club is hosting this blitz? Yeah, so... I suppose it's vitally important. There's a few things in this one, really, you know, and, and I know people are saying, oh, it's non-competitive, sure, it's easy to give them game time, equal game time. Asher, guys, let's be realistic here now. <laughs> Not every coach thinks like that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, whether it's a go against blitz and non-competitive blitz, still the philosophy of the coach is vitally important in this area. But there's just a few things I would probably just throw out there for people to, to just to think about um, in regard to this uh, opportunity. I would see this, if I, I'm talking about the coach that's probably going to this blitz or, or involved in this blitz, and I would say is always view it as, number one, as a learning opportunity. So here's an opportunity for you as coaches to observe your players in a, in a game environment uh, whereby it's an opportunity to see, well, how far have they improved and developed? That's how you should always uh, approach blitzes. It's an opportunity for players to translate what they learned on the pitch to see how would they do on a game situation. Okay, that's that's what it's about. That's what blitzes are about. That's how you should approach it. Okay, that would be my first point I'd make on that. I suppose what I would also do if I was going to this is I'd find out well, how many teams I'm allowed to bring and does that match what I'm trying to do? So, for example, if you're going to blitz and they say, you can only bring 10 players now. So that means I have another 15 players I can't bring. So I need to make the decision, Am I? is that is that in line with what I'm trying to do? So I'm not going to tell 15 players you can't come to a blitz, even though it's non-competitive or whatever it may be. I'm just being hypothetical here, okay? So just understand it. Does it match your philosophy in the blitz that you're going to achieve? And can everybody get an opportunity to play at this blitz? That's, that's vitally important. I suppose just my final point, this is for me as a coach, I would say I probably wouldn't go into this blitz with just – Two, uh, say, if I had two teams and I'd, I'd have the same team together for the whole blitz day, I probably wouldn't approach it that way. I would again use this as a, as a learning opportunity to see how girls improved from our training, but also I would love to try out different things. So, like PJ said, I'd try out different positions, I'd play our players in different positions. That's what I'd try. Thanks, PJ. Excellent point. I would also, PJ, what I do as well is I might play the second game where they're playing with their own age group. I might play the third game where they're playing with similar ability. I might play the third game where they're mixing and matching ability levels. So you're now viewing your players in different scenarios and different circumstances. And you always learn more about players in that scenario. So how does the perceived strong player react when they need to probably work with, you know, and develop and, and work with their teammates who are perceived weaker. How do they react to that scenario? That's all learning. Or do we just go in and bring our, our best team and do what they'll do very well, and we bring our weaker team over here. We should look, yeah, hopefully they do okay. It'd be great. So they're getting game time. It's just great. I don't know are we achieving much by doing that. That's just only my thought process on that, Garod. I wouldn't say it's right or wrong, but I would definitely like to mix and match in what I'm trying to do. And see no, I think I think you make some very good points. That be creative, keep changing it up. It even relates back to how you would train, and I, that's what I always think when you're when you want to make the most of these blitz days, whether you're running it, whether your other teams. If you're bringing all these teams, you want to set up during the week or in training prior to prepare all these players. So I would definitely look at implementing small sided games make sure every girl in your session has the ball the entire time it's not big sided games 15 on 15 
And then the stronger players are running your sessions. They're getting most of the ball. So then when you come to an equal opportunity, go game splits, some of these players aren't as confident as the other players on the team. So how do you prepare yourself and then get those players ready for your blitz? Eh? Is that giving them equal opportunities, equal playing time within your sessions leading up to that? So when they're playing a certain position for a certain amount of time, or even that idea of rotating your players, do that in your sessions. So they're used to that and they're making the most of their time. They're not squandering it or playing different teams for the first time. And they're not feeling as shy as players might be because they've confident they've done that and emulated that in their training sessions. So it's good to prepare your players for that. So they're getting the most and having fun in those blitz days and learning more, as Will mentioned. And I think Derek got out on that one. I would communicate, guys, what the plan of action is to the players prior to the blitz day. So I would tell them, guys, this is how we're going to actually approach Saturday. We're going to have four games or five games. We're going to do X, Y, and Z in those games so that they're all aware. So that when they turn up, then they know what's expected of them in terms of their challenge. So the communication is very important. I think, Liam, you had a very good point here. Like, find out beforehand how many, how many a side is the, is the blitz day. You know, how many subs will you have? Because all those things will determine how successful your day will be in your planning. So I would find out as much as I could about the blitz before I make a decision where this is right for us or not. Because you need to think about your players always. You need to always think about your players in your center, center of, your, of your attention. How many times have we gone to blitzes whereby we think it's something, but it's not, and therefore we disappoint a lot of players because we're told, oh, this is only seven aside. Or we only have two teams. So it's very important we're aware of the length, the duration of the games, how many aside is it, how many games they get, and that allow you to plan accordingly to make sure you get the best learning opportunity out of it for you as coaches, but also as players. But I would communicate that to the players beforehand as well. I don't get all is anything with that before we move on. No, no, but a very good point by Liam is that yeah, you could try and do your rotating and keep that going. But if there's not enough games or long enough games, there could be two or three minutes for certain players. And that's not worth it. So yeah, very, very good to be conscious of what type of blitz, how that blitz day is being ran in particular. Very good and point. I, and another good point, before I move on, and this is this is a real life scenario because I, I just came into my head. I joined watching a coach in a blitz one time, guys, and they were about equally okay, don't oh, give them game time. So they're only getting two or three minutes in every game. So in the coach's head, oh, they're getting game time, but they're not really, guys. Come on, they're not. They're only getting three or four minutes in each game. Okay that's not equal game time, or that's not giving them the opportunity to develop. But also what I noticed is in coaches and blitzes was they were taking on and off the same players, but they were leaving the perceived stronger players on all the time. I don't know, again, are you really challenging that stronger player even? Because, you know, you know they're never taken off. So there's just certain things that we observe. You need to be very aware of your actions. Does your actions meet your, your words? If you're inclusive and you're open and you're, you want to improve, improve all players, players improve by playing. But if you play certain players all the time and other players only certain times, then I don't know is everybody in, in developing and improving. Just something to think about. That's all. That's all. Okay, Gerard, final scenario. Perfect. Um, okay, and this is quite a common one. I think this affects te most teams nearly every year anyway. So you have six players that you rely on to perform on a regular basis. However, during the year, you know that three of them are going away on holidays. <laughs> How do you prepare for this scenario? So what do you think, Will? So if you have a team and you obviously do have teams, you're still uh, coaching on a variety of levels. I, I think it's a similar scenario, but you need to be prepared for it. Yeah, I think it goes back to your overall. I, we did a webinar recently on, I suppose, using positive language in a coaching session. I think this is where it's really important in terms of, you know, at the start of the year, you're outlining to everybody that we want to improve and develop everyone and that we're going to need everybody throughout the year and that we're not going to be relying on certain players. So I think pre-preparation is vitally important. In, in training sessions, even, Garod, do you know what I mean? We're picking our teams. I right? make sure that maybe the perceived stronger players 
will maybe be a sub on a, a, in a training game. Or if I'm playing games, I would make sure that, you know, those three, or, those, those, those three players mightn't be starting. Maybe I might start one of them or maybe two of them. So that players, I'm getting an opportunity for the players who are playing with them to not be so reliant on them, if that makes sense. So if, it's, if I go through the season and I know they're going away for two or three weeks during the summer, um, and I'm playing these players all the time, and they're 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 the real key players for us. And without them, geez, well, we're in trouble, Maria. Then I'm kind of you know setting that up for failure. Then down the road, so I would actually say, right, okay, I would actually mix and match. I maybe just maybe not start one or two of these players, so that players get an opportunity to to play. That it's about the whole team, if that makes sense, Carol. That not one or two players, if they if they're present or not. Will, will upset the whole rhythm of what we're trying to do. So I would definitely, I suppose, under, I, number one, be aware they're leaving. I'd be number two, then planning well in advance, well, how am I going to make sure that every player is not worried that Mary's missing tomorrow or Mary, Joan and Sheila are missing for three weeks, that every player feels that no matter who's playing, we're going to compete. So I use that word and that language of we're competing the best way we can. Um, but I definitely would pre-plan it. I would definitely set it up so that I won't wait for the three girls to go for to go, oh, do you know, we're not winning because we're missing our three best players. And that's a very easy thing to say and do. And I think that's a bit of a cop up, a cop, a cop out, as I say. Your job is there to develop everybody. Um, and I would say in your previous games, all the way up leading to that, then I wouldn't be over reliant on those players, knowing that they won't be there in a few weeks' time. So therefore, it's about developing everybody and give everybody an opportunity to play and, and challenge. I don't know. Is that Ramesh? I don't know, but uh, that's my thoughts on the road. No, absolutely, uh, absolutely, and it's uh, some very good points, and it's it's very true. Uh, this and this is the same can be the same for um, a sudden injury or a spell of injuries within your team, and is it's usually too late before we realise the importance of being inclusive and being that coach. And we look at being inclusive, everyone getting equal opportunities, but it's also the messages that you send. It's how you speak to your players. It's like, okay, let's do this same drill. And that's it. You start to drill the same strong, perceived stronger players are covering, touching most of the ball during the drill, things like that. Or else, do you start every drill or every session saying, okay, we're all here. We're all of the same opportunities to start the weekend or for the next game. And then let's go out and see what you have. Everyone gets the same opportunity and you're all going to be treated equally. It's the types of messages and, as you say, verbally, how you communicate with your players. If you insert those messages, and I think insert them regularly, not the whole time. It doesn't have to be every second of your session. But at the start or at the end of every session going, well done to everyone. Great. What are we going to work on for the next week? Some people mightn't start some games. And they might get it into their head that I don't need to be as mentally prepared as the other players who are starting until that player gets injured, goes on holidays. Then how am I going to be ready it's unfair me as a player to be mentally preparing her in a shorter space of time for the next game, where all year I haven't felt like I've been good enough or I feel like there's a, a slight difference between me and the starting team. So it's exactly that, what you mentioned. How do you get that message across from the start? From the start, say, I am clear, I am on bias, everyone will get the same opportunity to start and that's what we're going to do. Yeah, and I think I think Gerard, how many times does a sub goalkeeper come into this conversation? You know what I mean? So we play the same goalkeeper for every game throughout the year, and the first round of championship match, she gets injured. Oh, Mary, you come in. And then all of a sudden we're expecting Mary to, to reach the same levels, but sure, we never gave her a game. So how exactly. do we know? So that I think that's a nice example of even you know this similar scenario whereby we're over-reliant on certain players. But if we don't develop the other players, there's going to come a scenario whereby you're going to need those players. And how do we, I suppose, counteract that? But if they don't get the opportunity to develop, then we, we, we won't be able to, I suppose, make sure they're ready when they are called upon. I know, Dad, you said there about moving down to a weaker division. I, I, there's for and against that, I suppose. You just It depends, going back to the point you made or Gary or Garrod earlier on about, it does depend really, Adele. Sometimes going down to, to a lower division, I don't know, is that always the answer? 
if you have 20 players and you know you're going to have 18 players during the summer, then you still have players. So I think it's sometimes it's not always a solution of going down to a weaker division. That's just my thoughts. Um, but you know your own players and your own and your own uh, group. Um, yeah, and another thing to look at as well is even if you're doing tactics, you might say, "Oh, these are the starting team, so we need to cover tactics with these players." So yeah. under, it's important then for any players who might come into that scenario halfway through a game if there's an injury or before a game if someone is away that they know exactly from throughout the year how to react or how you want them to play or what your way you're lining up your players in that scenario. Yeah. So the only way you can avoid getting into trouble if something was to happen in replacing a player is to prepare them. Yeah. The only way to re- prepare them is to include them in all of those different areas. Yeah. So if you're doing tactics with your first 15, mix them in and out. Mix the other players who might be there or might not be there. Exactly. I think it's a very good point, Garod. You know, we're doing tactics. Oh, we just talk to the first 15. I'm telling you. And Everybody and needs to know is, their role, don't they? Don't they? Yeah, really? and a, lot, a misconception is like uh, inclusion and competition are separate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can manage yeah. both if you understand how. And I, I, you're willing to look for ways around it. And that's what we're trying to do and provoke thought in t- this evening. Okay, before we move on to the final slides, I just want to read out a few comments here. I think it's good just to, for a thought-provoking point of view. Um, so we have uh, Helena. You can also have a very different scenario if three good players come back from a vital, to, to a vital match and then the three who are playing all along are dropped. So it's important not always to start the stronger players. I agree, mix and match and don't give up. Don't give up the impression you're relying on certain players, 100%. Um, and I do agree with that. I think at times, guys, there's opportunities where... You could start one or two of your perceived stronger players on the bench and, and as you say to them, you're coming on at halftime, use this opportunity, observe the game and you know you could use it as a learning opportunity as well. So I definitely think it's a very good one. But again, goes back to the challenge and the expectations. Oh, if you've got to win the game, you know, I wonder what will we do then. Folks on the perceived stronger players can discourage the so-called weaker players, says Shauna, eh? and they may not continue. So they feel like the team is only a team with these core players. So I think it's vitally important, guys, you know, if we focus on, you know, when you go into the dressing room, it goes, pass the ball to Mary. You know, pass the ball to Mary. Mary run up and down the field all the time and she'll score you 20 points and you'll win every game. But there'll come a day when Mary won't be there because she might be injured or she might be, she might have the flu or whatever it may be. Then what do we do? So it's vitally important we don't over-rely ourselves on certain individuals because you never know when you may need the player. That's number 16, 17, 18 or 19. Also, you never know that maybe in five or six years' time that that player could be the, the, the hero. Um, so it's very important we never dismiss anybody early. Okay, Gerard, um, we're just moving on. Yeah, perfect. And uh, yeah, on from that and to reiterate what we mentioned earlier, it's like, who is it for? Is it for you, the coach? Is it for the players? And if it's for the players, it's for every player that you have attending your sessions. So that has to be always your priority, not you and what you're looking to achieve in relation to your own kind of agenda if they align perfectly but it has to be the focus all on the players um just to summarize some of the things that we took from uh, some of those and I, I think a lot of the points we took and will would agree were all from the chat uh some fantastic feedback it's great to know you're thinking in those ways uh so very good, and thank you for that engagement throughout. Um, so just smiles, being inclusive allows you to adapt, even in a competitive environment. How can we be creative even in a competitive environment? And that's the most important thing. It's, okay, if we're missing players, how can we be adapting to that scenario? If we're approaching uh, at different stages of our um, season, how do we, how can we, bring in and incorporate new players who've never experienced the game before. We can adapt in all scenarios. Let your training and the drills you choose promote interaction and build a team bond. So just like we were saying, dividing up the team to keep motivating players. If we bring them together, you promote interaction, then there's different ways that you can uh, challenge players within that same setting, within that same group setting. And I'll challenge you, try and do that in your next session. See now how you can 
put in a condition within a game or within an activity that you're doing in your next session and see how that works for you. I'd be very interested to find out. And also in relation to lecture training just promote interaction, um, avoid comparisons. So you don't want players comparing themselves to other players. So if you recognize that or if you see there's slight divisions, either do what William said, mix the groups up or else don't divide into so many groups so often. Challenge all players appropriately to their ability level. And I, I feel everyone, uh, a lot of players, depending on what teams you're with, but a lot of coaches in general think we refer to underage players when we talk about this. For appropriate ability. It's like, oh, when it's underage players, there's a big difference. Not always. When more ma mature, older teams, senior teams, junior teams, intermediate teams, there can be different levels of ability, strong le different levels of ability. It's how we can be creative in relation to challenging our players. And one example I always give in the competitive environment is if you have a game of training or in a match scenario, how do you challenge a player? It might not simply change, the, change cones, change anything. You might just talk to that one player and just say, okay, this time you keep running down the sideline. You're brilliant. Okay, very good at that. But if something happens within a game, I want to see you do a sidestep and maybe take that girl out on the inside. So you're just creating a scenario. You're creating a challenge for your player within the setting that you've already set up. So it's just how we can look at things, how we can kind of come up with ideas. But make sure now after tonight, as coaches, we are looking for those things and looking for those opportunities. And then... That links directly into providing equal opportunities wherever possible, be it in the training environment, be it in a game scenario, wherever you can fight, uh, give those equal opportunities. And one thing that all, often gets overlooked is giving equal opportunities for uh, players and girls to voice their opinions. There might be girls who are starting regularly and then another girl who's on the sideline, possibly a lot of the time if it's a championship season or whatever it might be. But Make sure those girls might be seeing more than some of the players on the pitch are actually seeing. So give those players a voice. They might have something that they want to contribute. Make them feel more a part of our team as well in that, in that respect. Will, is there anything you want to add in there? Yeah, no, before, like, before we go to the, the, the final slides of tonight, I do believe that if you do think about what you're doing, you're able to adapt accordingly. I do believe if you plan... Uh, and pre-prepare and you uh, set up scenarios and games, then I do believe players can adapt the car in, the, in a competitive environment as well. Like there's going to come a time where, you know what, they're, going, they're not going to be looking to the sideline for your uh, inspiration or, you know, what, what are the solutions? You're hoping that they'll be able to solve themselves in the field as well. So it's vitally important. I think if you do think about all these things tonight and just, you know, if there's one thing you can take from it, I definitely do believe it will help you be more inclusive coach in terms of equal opportunity and developing as players. Yeah, and thank you, Will. And in relation to, we were kind of going through barriers this evening, how we're looking at inclusion from that kind of perspective, understanding you as a coach, understanding the obstacles that you face. So when those happen, it's so, sometimes it's hard, it's disheartening. So it's always great to remember why, and that's why we both, almost finished now this evening but before we do it's remembering why why the impact you have as a coach you are a role model you they these players look up to you they learn from you they learn life lessons from you you're given opportunities for these players within the sport that they love or lack of opportunities if you weren't being inclusive so realize how much of an impact that has how important those players feel in your environment you're making those players feel important. They want to be a part of that group. This is beyond even the sport in some scenarios, but in that same setting. And then overall well-being, and we can't talk about it enough in this modern day, but well-being and mental health for all of our players is so important. So when we create that positive coaching environment, we understand how much of an impact we have and why we are there in the first place it makes it easier for us to be as to try and be inclusive to all of our players as possible. 
And that's what should be motivating us and you as coaches going forward. So if you ever have one of those obstacles up against you, re remember the why and that will get you through it. I think that's a very good point. You know, when you have to make a hard decision, go back to why you're here. I think sometimes you'll find the answer fairly fast. You know, I think it's a good one. Well done, uh, Garrod. I think it's a very good uh, point you made there. Perfect. I know you've been fantastic throughout the evening into the chat. We're going to ask you one last time. Just think, what was the one thing, the standout moment for you as a coach from this webinar? What was, what's one thing you might do differently the next time you go coaching or something you're going to look out for or be more aware of? Love to know your thoughts. And just there, guys, you know, I know a few had in the start about, you know, expectations of this program. This is actually a second webinar on being an inclusive coach. We did a webinar previously that's on the LJFA YouTube channel, guys. It's available to, for you to view, where we look at, I suppose, uh, dealing with players of various ability levels, maybe players that may have certain disability. Um, you, know, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that we cover. Dual players, we cover that. Players are involved with different sports. So please, guys, if you get an opportunity over the coming days, weeks, give a look at the LJFA YouTube channel. And we have another webinar that looks specifically at those topics as well. So please, guys, we'd love to hear your feedback on that as well. Um, so coming through the chat, um, Shauna says, I'll be 100% more aware and conscious of my philosophy while planning and the season training. 100%, Shauna. I think that's most important, Shauna. We have a webinar on creating a positive uh, uh, coaching environment that looks at philosophies as well. But I do believe, Shauna, you need to be clear yourself of what is it you're about. Why are you there? What is your what what is you want to get from being involved in coaching? I think Shauna, if you can nail that and write it down, I think when you come up against a lot of a lot of challenges, you'll be able to answer a lot of those barriers. Like John Garrod, is there anything else coming through? Yeah, there's plenty. Um, I like this one. Uh, not being afraid uh, to play the weaker player, being confident in your decision, and um, a word we always like to use in the LGFA in relation to that is having courage as a coach. You need to have that courage. We don't say it's easy, but when you know what you want, what your goal is, it's having the courage to go after that. I think that's a big one, having the courage to do it. There's a lot of people out there that have loads and loads of opinions, lads, loads of opinions, you know? But if you feel and you know it's the right thing to do, go with your gut and do it. You'd feel much better afterwards for it. You know, you mightn't keep everybody happy outside of the fence regarding the same, but if you know it's the right thing by the players, um, then do it. Yeah, nine times out of ten, your gut will tell you the right thing. And Helena, one thing definitely to take away is mixing and matching abilities and games and having the courage to stand over our decision. So thank you, Helena. Um, that's a very good point. Uh, Garoda, anything else coming through? Um, I think a lot of those points, those are very similar as well as um, mixing and matching, being conscious that you can and you uh, catering for all abilities within the same session and just kind of knowing what to look for now as coaches. Yeah, not that um, it's not you're applying an activity or a drill that you've planned. It's kind of adapting that to your players. Yeah. So how does that sit with your players? It's not going here is our plan. You have to conform to the plan. It's how we adapt our plan to conform to our players. Yeah, yeah, very good. I like uh, Adele says, we'll just take one or two more comments, guys, and we'll leave you in. I like, uh, we continue to focus on each player's strengths. Very good, very important, because sometimes we always focus on the weakness, but always focus on people's strengths and get better at them. I think that's excellent, Adele. Well, well good, great point. And also the scaffold, a healthy, open environment around each player. Love that word, scaffold. That kind of, you know, there's a lot more, you know, around that environment to make sure that player or players can develop. And um, going back to the point I made earlier on about maybe the coach and uh, the coach, your fellow coaches and the club backing what you're doing as well, like that uh, very much. Um, so, Kieran, uh, dealing with missing the key players and promoting the whole uh, idea, building team confidence. Yeah, definitely. I just think it's vitally important, Kieran. Every, every year, there's players going to be missing. You're going to be missing your so called good players as well. This game still get plays. How many times, guys, actually, you know, do we cancel games because we're missing one or two players? What's that saying to the other 10 players on the sideline? I think that's, I, I don't know. If you have enough players, play the game. 
Do you know what I mean? And I think you're seeing out the wrong signal at all times that you know we're, oh we can't play this game because we're missing Mary and Joan and Sheila. But if you have four other players on the sideline, give them their opportunity. You never know. You never know. One or two of them might flourish. You never know. Gerard, last point yourself, if you want to pick one or two. Yeah, last point, and I'll, I'll be reflected. And I think it's kind of um, it's kind of ran throughout this evening anyway with a lot of these scenarios. Is uh, that uh, the play, um, if you're to implement any of these new strategies, having the buy-in from your fellow coaches is extremely important. It's whatever you're trying to achieve. If everyone else is on the same uh, level, we all know what you're trying to achieve from the start of the year throughout to the end of the year. That they are with you and they're supporting you in relation to it. Then you know that same message that you want to get across is being spread across by your entire coaching team and they're backing you up and you, each other, you're backing each other. That's very important to get that buy-in and that courage being shown from all of those members of your coaching staff as well. Uh, before we leave you, we just want you to remember, when you see something in front of you, the key is to focus on the goals. Don't focus on the obstacles. Remind yourself why remind yourself what you're trying to achieve and then go after it. Okay, don't focus on the negatives, focus on the ways you can uh, manage the positives and how you can adapt your situation to get to achieve those goals. And so, I think I think everything's a possible to get old. Okay, you mightn't get there in a straight line, but I do believe, you know, if you, you know, you'll get there eventually. <laughs> it might be two or three years time, but you will get there eventually if you keep, you know, Solid to what you're about and solid to your, and, you know, be, be, be true to your values and I think you'll be okay. I think you'll be okay, yeah. Gerard. I don't know. Very but, good. But, yeah, and you won't see the results of your long-term goals straight away, so don't get disheartened. Exactly. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you so much to Will for, um, for all of your um, feedback, all of your personal experiences and all those practical experiences. Fantastic. And I feel, really feel like a lot of the participants this evening learned a lot from those uh, experiences. So thank you very much. I want to thank everyone who was on this evening. And um, if you have any questions, we'll stay on for another few minutes. But other than that, have a have a lovely evening. Keep safe. Keep well. Thank you. And as I said, Gerard, on the LJFA YouTube channel, we have this recorded. This will be up there in the coming days. So please give a look over the coming days. Share with your, with your fellow coaches. Share within the club. We have a lot of other webinars up there as well that are, that are linked into all, they're all kind of linked in together, if that makes sense. And they all make sense when you watch them all back. So hopefully you get the value out of them over the coming weeks and months. On that note, we'll see you again uh, uh, soon enough for our next webinar, which is, I suppose, how to uh, deal with a dis disruption in your season. Uh, on that note, thank you very much, everyone, and good evening.